Good morning, church. Let me say it again. Good morning, church. Good morning. What a special morning, right? We can come before the Lord um, and we can have this intimate moment of worshiping. This morning, I have the privilege of uh, sharing the word with you. Uh, and believe me, I've been praying a lot about this message. But before getting into the sermon, let me ask you something. Have you ever done something for what you have been cornered or accused? Let me explain this a little more. When I was a little kid, I remember that I used to ride my bike. I have the coolest bike in my neighborhood. This was not a handbrake, you know. This is, remember, this is Guatemala, okay? And so my bike had some coaster brakes uh, system, you know. I, I kind of studied that. I, I did not know how, they, how it was called. But it had that system, you know, that you basically are riding your bike and then you hit it, right? Uh, and then you brake. And so I was, I was, you know, riding my bike and then everyone will press the handbrakes and they will stop. But I will go and, you know, just going fast and then hit the brakes and drift a little bit, you know, and then I was looking cool. That was incredible for me. I was the coolest kid in my neighborhood, you know, and it was incredible. But my neighborhood used to connect to a shopping center. And so on that shopping center, you can go through it, you know, for, through a sidewalk. And so I was going through the sidewalk and I remember we always race with my friends, you know. Now, let me ask you this, and you don't have to raise your hand, especially if you're inviting one of your neighbors today. But how many of us have a neighbor that you know that you need to pray a little more than the others? You know what I'm talking, right? It's that neighbor that always gives a little bit of trouble. You don't know if plays hands or play not fist, okay? But you know what I'm saying. You need to pray extra hard, you know, for that neighbor. We had this neighbor. And, you know, it was a little bit of a conflict, always, you know, fighting for parking spots, always fighting. This was an apartment complex. And she had a little kid. This is important to the story, okay? I was riding my bike, and then one day, coming down from the shopping center, there was a gate, and I could not see to the other side. And so when I was going fast, you know, and I was racing, you know, my friends, suddenly, the kid, you know, the son of this wonderful neighbor, you know, came and just show up in front of me. And I hit the little kid. And I can even picture, you know, myself, you know, seeing the small toot, you know, on slow motion flying, you know. And I saw the little toot going and I was like, oh Lord, what did just happen? On that moment, all my friends that were racing just came across me and they were like, oh, they call me, so my name is Otto Javier Lemus Pineda, but you can call me OJ or Senor Hugo, you know, like Cody does, which is Mr. Juice, which I don't know. Anyways, they were all coming like, Otto, oh man, you are in trouble. And your mom and dad, you know what I'm talking, right? It's, you know, you know, it's just, and, and I was like, I was a little more scared for the punishment than for what happened. And then this lady came to me, and I remember, I mean, I, she was very big for my size. I was eight, nine years old, and you know, I, 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 was, I was very scared. And she came, and she was like, I will make you pay for this. I'm gonna pause that story there, because that's one of the most probably threatening moments of my life, as a kid, you know, as a kid. Because I was very scared of what was gonna happen with my parents. Now let me go to the Bible. And let's go to Matthew chapter eight, verse two. And it says, now early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and talked them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman 
was caught in adultery. In the very act, now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? And the Bible says, you know, that they said this, testing him, that they might have something of which accuse him. And I'm going to pause there. Because on this morning, we're going to be seeing, and I asked a professional Greek professor for this, and mentioned me that the word is harmatology. I hope I said it well. If not, I will reveal the name afterwards, you know. Uh, but harmatology is the theology of sin. The theology of sin. And so let's go a little bit to the origin. And now my Greek professor said that you don't pronounce the H. It's just amartia, which in Greek means fault, failure, originally was missing the mark. And allergy, we know that is the study. In Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Harmatology then explains why we miss the mark. Sin miss, means miss the mark. We miss the mark when we sin. Explains the consequences of missing the mark. And there are some important questions. Uh, these are some of these important questions from harmatology. But what is the definition of sin? Because sin is something that it's a little controversial for us as human, you know. Uh, some of us, you know, would like to point a little bit, you know, maybe uh, are in the situation of these little kids, you know, that were my friends. You know, we're coming like, oh, you did this, you know. And some of us, sin is the thing that cripple us to continue walking to the Lord. And it's what, you know, we struggle with. So what is sin? Sin is described in the Bible as the transgression of law of God. And we must understand something. There's an origin for the sin. And we can go to Isaiah 14, chapter 14, verse 12 and 14. And here, here we can see a little bit. And if you read, this, it says... Sorry, I can't read. <laughs> but you can read. There you go. How you are falling from heaven of shining stars, sun of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth. You who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will proceed on the mountains of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high and this is lucifer and this is how sin originated him thinking that he can be in the place of god and then he was cast out and then satan comes to the earth and then he brought the sin to earth and in the garden of eden satan satan, satan deceives man by getting him to sin through Eve when he offers to eat the forbidden fruit, telling him that she will acquire wisdom and she's not going to die being equal to God. So this is a little bit of how the sin, you know, started. It started with Satan, but then he deceived the humanity um, and then you know what happened. I mean, we're living the consequences of that. And so let me share to you the main idea. Adam inherited sin to us by disobedience of one of the men, many were made sinners. But the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was enough to pay the debt of sin. We have to receive it, believe it, live, enjoy the freedom that the Father provide through Jesus. Now, when we talk about sin, this is a very delicate, you know, subject. Uh, we don't like to say, hey, I did it, you know, but probably before coming here, we all made even a little sin, you know. 
uh, husbands were a little, ma- a little mad, you know, with the wife, like, you have to hurry up. I have to serve this morning. Come on, you know. And then uh, maybe the, as parents, you know, we were like, kids, hurry up. I cannot believe that you're late again. And we get easily caught, you know, in, in, in sin because it's in our nature. And so to understand a little bit of harmatology, I want to invite you to see seven truths that will help us to understand the doctrine of sins. I promise you, it's gonna go very fast. I promise you. I'm not too nervous about preaching. I'm, I'm nervous about the afterwards, which is Samwa's blessing, okay? Let's go to the first one, inheritance guilt. We are constituted guilty by the sin of Adam. Adam. And then Paul is teaching us that when Adam sinned, the guilt is attributed to all his descendants. This is a little tricky, right? Because I don't know how many of us are paying for the debts of our parents, but it seems a little unfair, right? That you have to pay for debts that maybe the generation before or before, you know, made. Imagine having a debt of $1 million as you are born. Welcome to the world. You owe a million dollars. When are you gonna you know, write your first check? I don't know, you know, it's, 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 that, that's a way that I see it. And in Romans chapter five, verse 12, it says, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered in the world and death through the sin, and thus death is spread to all men because all sin. So Adam and Eve, on the very beginning, because they were representing the humanity, when they sin, like automatically, it went to all of us. Even though we did not exist, we were represented by Adam as ancestor. In this way, we inherit by nature the sin that Adam introduced to the human race. If we see on Romans chapter five, verses 18 to 19, that says, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will made righteous. And this is something beautiful that we'll be talking a little bit afterwards. Yes, because of one man, we're all sinners. But then the father had a plan. The father had a plan to fix all this. And so many people have really, you know, protested or, or they have said, I do not agree with this idea. Yeah, I do not agree with the idea that because one man sin, I, you know, I'm guilty too. I, I don't see why. But, you know, if we are not agreeing with this, they're like, you know, why should Adam decide for me? Decide for me? If we think on this equation, you know, then why also we will have to say that it's unfair that we're represented by Christ. Does it make sense? Adam's sin, you know, and so we're sinners. But because of Jesus, we can be redeemed. So that's the beauty of this truth. If we want to be represented by Christ, we must also accept that on, one day, then the, on the day of transgression, we were represented by Adam. So church, there's an opportunity on this morning that we can recognize that even though there's sin in this world, because we look to Jesus, there's also forgiveness. And I will invite you to read, you can read at home, Romans 5, 12, 21. When you read about Romans uh, 5, 12, 21, the central theme or the central subject of the whole passage could be summed up in that God deals with us either as represented by Adam therefore guilty or represented by Christ, and therefore we're covered 
by his justice. And so that's, that's something beautiful. If the sovereign mesas, you know, can go a little bit deep on that, do it and then have the discussions, you know, because this is, this is important for us to know as a church. The second one, see, we're in the second now already, is inherit corruption. We receive a sinful nature from Adam. In addition to the legal, uh, to the legal guilt, we receive because of Adam's sin, we have also inherited a sin by nature because of it. This means that we are born corrupt and by the fact of all of us committing sin, in this way, the sentence of guilt that we have inherited from Adam is confirmed. That means that it's in our nature to sin, you know? Maybe sometimes you wake up, you know, and, and, and you think, oh, I'm gonna commit today to not sinning. How many of us have tried to commit to a, a strict diet, you know? It's like you get up and you say, okay, I'm gonna eat clean this day. And then, you know, I'm, I'm, okay, it's me, okay? My wife, you know, she prepares my lunch, you know, and then everything is clean, you know, green vegetables and everything. And I have, and then everything is super clean. If I eat this, I'm gonna be healthy, as strong, and a little more handsome, right? <laughs> but then I come to the office and there's chocolate. And I see it, you know, and I'm like, Lord, I have my greens, I'm gonna stick to my diet. And then my hands start walking, you know, to that beautiful jar that contains all the American sugar, you know? Oh, so amazing. By nature, you know, we, we try to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay, you know, committed to this. But it's in our nature that we automatically stare. We don't even think about it. We're driving, you know, and then someone jump in front of us and we, 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 we say words even in other languages that we did not imagine that we know, you know? And so let's go to Psalm 51.5. And it says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in my sins, my mother conceived me. Which means that by, by, by being born, thank you, mi hermano. When we were born, we already had sin. It was in us. And this verse, so distressed was David over his own sin that looking back at his life, he realized that he was sinful from the very beginning. In Psalm 58, 3, it says, the weak are stranded from the wound. They go astray as soon as they are born speaking life, lies. The tendency in us is to sin, you know, is to go and grab that little chocolate, you know. It's just one little chocolate. But it's, it's in us, it's our tendency. I love you, mommy. I, I eat everything you give me, okay? I promise. Plus the chocolate. <laughs> so it's in us. The next one is total depravity. We lack the ability to do good. And you might say, hold on, hold on. I, I do good. You know, whenever I'm, I'm driving and I see someone that is in need, I, you know, I give them a little bit. But sometimes, you know, someone is coming on the highway, you know, near Sam's Club on Harvey Mitchell, and is offering you, you know, uh, something about, you know, restoration, and you automatically, well, the windows are already up in Texas, right? Because you don't drive with the windows down. But in Guatemala, you will do like, you know, and you just, this is me pulling, you know, this was before, right? And so you just pull up the window and then you kind of like start looking to your phone and there's the police and you put down the phone and so you start touching your skin. We try to avoid, you know, sometimes to do the good because it's not within us. It's not, it's not something that by nature we do. And in Romans 3, 10 to 12 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understand. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have come together, be, be, oh sorry. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Now, this doesn't mean that we're terrible people, right? This doesn't mean that we're as bad, 
you know, as we can be, we still have the imageness, you know, the image and likeness of God in us. We have his image and likeness and we're capable of doing things that are noble. You know, we volunteer, we go to mission trips, you know, and then we do things, you know, we do kind deeds. But however, because we were enemies or we're enemies of God, even these good deeds do not please him because we do not do this to honor him. When we're away from the Lord, everything that we do, that he just tries to cover, you know, it's, it's just, you know, a little makeup. And so we must understand in our daily life, we have to come to the Lord and surrender all. Even when we're gonna do something good, are we doing it for the right reason? Are we doing that mission trip because we really wanna go and spread the gospel? Or maybe we want a nice selfie, you know, and we wanna look good. There's a huge difference. Everything is the intention of the heart. The next one is that we have a to total inability. We are incapable of doing a spiritual good in our actions. An author, Robert Raymond says, because man is wholly or extensively corrupt, he is unable to change his character or to act in a matter other than his corruption. This is very strong. He cannot discern, love, or choose the things that please God. Now, this for me is, is, is something that confronts me because, you know, how many times we're approaching to someone, you know, that maybe needs help, maybe it's a family member, and then because there's this knowledge, there, there's no knowledge of God, you know, even when we try, if the person doesn't recognize Jesus as Lord and Savior, we can try and we can try and we can try, but nothing is gonna happen. Because in our nature, we are corrupt. Jeremiah 13, 23 says, can the Ethiop Ethiopian change his skin or the leper its spot? Then you may also do good who are accustomed to do evil. So this is what sin says to us, you know, you will never change. The way you were born, the way you will leave this earth, but not in Christ, amen? Not in Christ. Romans 8, 7a says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If we continue, we all are sinners before God. Now, on Psalm 143, this text, you know, teaches the universal sinfulness of humanity and that no one is exempt. This Psalm says, do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your right, no one living is righteousness or is righteous. Solomon says that there is no man who does not sin. Now, is any of us here who can raise the hand and say, I do not sin, I'm sorry, OJ, you know, no, you're wrong about it. No, we, we all sin. We all sin, like we said at the very beginning. Romans 3.23 says again, you know, because all sin, they fall short of the glory of God. So it's in us, you know, it's in us that we sin. John said, behold the lamb, the son of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the only way that we can, that we can, you know, take the sin away. Now, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was enough to pay for the sins of the man. That is to say that God and those of us who are in Christ, do not, he do not see us as sinners. Our spirits have been perfected. And Hebrews says, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. However, if you 
see it this way. In our flesh, there's still a presence of sin. So if we, if we, uh, if we see Paul struggling, you know, with, with the way he was, he was living the life, like he knew that the sin was in his life. Paul says that it dwells in him. And Romans 7, 17 says, but now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. This brings to this question, church. This is the question. How is possible? Do we think that sin can be removed? This is kind of like one of the toughest questions that we have because we, we often consider if I'm coming to church, if I already accept Jesus, why I keep sinning? Why I keep having these thoughts? And we pray and we often come before the Lord and we said, uh, and we, we start, you know, like having all this mindset, you know, the enemy start deceiving us. Like, you know, is it possible for me not to sin? And because they're sinning us, we start to get frustrated. And we start getting away from the Lord. We stop reading our, our Bible. We start coming to church because we, we got frustrated. But we have to understand something, church. We are going to be dealing with sin every day of our lives because it's in our nature. Because it's in us. But also, every day of our lives, we can come before the Lord and we can confess our sins to him. And then we have the church where we can come and we can worship and we can pray one for another. And that's how we continue walking in this life. But we often forget about this and we get frustrated and we get caught up in a moment that we feel that we cannot move forward. Maybe we feel that we're too attached to addictions and we struggle and we struggle, but we are living in this life and in this life, we will have affliction. We will have struggles, but we have to look to Jesus. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do as a church. So Paul has this very clear. And he makes the questions, are we or are we not sinners? In 1 Timothy chapter 1, 15, he writes, this is faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ, Jesus Christ, came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He have it very clear. It's not that you are saved and you automatically stop sinning. No, we have to fight the good fight because also we have to show to others, those who are in darkness, that it can be done that you can come to Christ and you can overcome the way of sins. So the next one, we're legally guilty before God because of a single sin. Now, sin is a personal opposition to God. It's not the greatness of the law that makes sin deserve punishment, but the greatness of God who gave the law. We all sin, and sin in multiple times, right? I didn't hear amen, but I'm assuming. Which is an offense against God and for which we are responsible. However, the judgment and condemnation come for one sin only, the sin of Adam or Adam. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, verse 16. And if you are reading this, you can see the next, it says, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense result in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses result in justification. The last one, because of the sin, we deserve the wrath of God. We were children of God because although we were not children of disobedience, we walk among them and did the same as them. Ephesians chapter two, verse three says, among who also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're 
by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Now, what does this mean? This means that for our conduct, we deserve the same punishment as those outside. We gotta be very clear about this church because sometimes we believe that because we, you know, we are Christians, you know, we are completely separate and then we see others and we said, oh, those are lost, you know, those are gone. Oh, my mother-in-law, oh, gone, you know, my tío, my uncle, gone, you know. No, we were in the same situation and we deserve the same. So we must not forget that we have to preach the gospel to others. It's not that this is exclusive to us now and we are a little club. No, we deserve the same punishment as those who were outside or are outside. The only difference between us believers and those who are in the world is that Christ extended mercy to us. We had with us a favor that we did not deserve. Never, let's never forget this. It's not because of what we did. It's not because we earn it. It's not because we give. It's not because we attend. It's not because we invite people, you know, all that is extra. What, what really matters is that Christ extended his mercy to us. And we heard, and we believed. Amen? So, if we go to John 3.36, it says the next, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If you see in the second part, you know, whoever refuses to believe in the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God upon him. This means that God save us and God save those who believe, but at the same time, he condemns those who despise that gift. And this is where a little controversy comes, you know, because people say, how, how a God that it says that is loving can condemn? But he already set the path to come to him and it's to believing in him, rejecting God through sin is only fair that we can receive the punishment that comes with him. So, knowing a little bit about this truth, what's the result? What should be the result? You probably have heard of this, for the wages of the sin is death. Now, if we do not have Christ, this is what we have. Sin equals death. And if all of us have sin, there is no other result than death. One of the most effective you know, ways of evangelize um, that I have seen is someone approaching, you know, this is a method of evangelism, you know, and it was someone coming in front of this person and then asking, you know, hey, have you ever still, you know? And the person said like, no, never, you know? And, and they said, well, when I was a little kid, I stole a candy, you know, from the store. And then the person said, have you ever lied, you know? No, never, you know, I don't lie. And then the person recognized like, okay, when I was a little kid, you know, or I kind of lied to my boss last week, you know, I said I was sick and I was not. And with this method, basically expose you to the 10 commandments. And then with, you know, at the result of the questions, you know, the person will say, I do not feel, you know, fulfill the 10 commandments. And so the person evangelizing, you know, will say, well, what is the result of failing this? And it will say, according to this law, death, you know. So if we think on that way, how many of us have failed the Ten Commandments? Many of us, often. And so the result 
of the sin is death, the eternal condemnation. God punishes sin and he does it because he is just. Condemnation is the fruit of sin. And the terrible consequence of sin is that we will have to appear before God on the judgment day. But saying this, I don't want to scare you, you know. I don't want you to be walking out of here like defeated, like, oh man. Okay, family, let's have a last meal, you know, because we're all sinners, you know. No, no, no. The Father made a way. Because God, he does not delight in condemning us. When we talk about, you know, being condemned, although it's established in the Bible, we have to think that God, in addition to being a judge, he is just. And he is also a loving father, like we heard earlier in, in the service, and seeks each of us to be saved from the condemnation. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, at some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why, you know, we're still here. That's why we're still uh, uh, coming and then we see our kids, you know, we see that the life continues and many will say, oh, the Lord should have come many years ago, but it's because he's extending his mercy to us. Romans 8, 1 said, therefore, now is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh. John 3, 18 says, he who believes in him is not condemned. So there's only one name who can change this destiny of condemnation. It is Jesus. It's the only way, only believing in him we can be saved of this destiny. Now, I know this is a lot of information, believe me. I prepare for a long time. <laughs> but it's not as complicated as we believe. Honestly, as I said earlier, how many of us sinned, you know, before coming to the service? If I ask to raise your hand, probably all of us should. I'm not asking for that. But the truth is, we're living our lives and we have to deal with this. We have to struggle with this and this fractures families, society, because sin is allowed in our lives, we struggle and we have we see different families and we see uh, different people, you know, just struggling in life and it's painful. It's very painful. But it is our job, church, to invite everyone to fix their eyes in Jesus. Because even when the damage is done, things can be restored and we can continue living a life fixing our eyes on Him. So, Remember the two stories that I mentioned at the very beginning? You know what happened when everyone came to me and point me and then this kind, amazing neighborhood, neighbor, you know, came to me and she was like, in Spanish it's like, hoy si vas a ver, which is like, you know, that's literal translation, you know, and, and so, I was, I was scared. I was thinking, I'm done. The kid was, you know, in blood. No tooth, you know, they, I don't know how they found the tooth, you know, but they have the tooth and it was like, he's not gonna be able to eat. He's not gonna be able to do anything. You have to give them a special food. And she, already, and she was, as I was, the, the, when the, where the accident happened to my house, it was probably, it was, it was not too much, you know, it was, it was an apartment complex. So I'm thinking on meters, sorry, I don't think on feet. But it, it, was, it was not too far, you know, from here to the entrance, let's say, you know. And, and I remember I felt, I felt that, that, that way to home, you know, really long. 
I felt that I was being, you know, people were laughing at me. They, she was, you know, just yelling at me all the time. And when she brought me in front of my mom, my, I remember I knocked the door, you know, and my mom opened. And of course, you know, as a good Latina mother, she was like, pero que paso, mijo? You know? Pero, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> but when she saw that there was someone accusing me and there was, you know, someone that I hurt, <laughs> she just told me, don't worry, mijo, come inside, go inside. And she started talking with the lady, you know, and I just heard everything. And she was like, don't worry, I will pay for everything. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, and, she, and, the, and the mom, the other mom, the, the kind neighbor, you know, she was yelling like, yeah, you have to pay and you have to, and I want you to punish him. And she was like, don't worry, I will talk to him. It was an accident. I remember that day and it, it was really in my heart, you know, it's still until this day. I really hope I can react with our future kids like my mom react with me, you know, that she defend me. I mean, I was behind, you know, uh, the, the, you know the, the door, and I was like, yay, that's my mom. She's defending me. And I was like, yes, nothing can touch me. Of course, later in that night, you know. <laughs> but at that moment, oh, I felt, you know, I mean, she, that lady, Wanted me, you know, being whooped on the street, or just on the street. This happened with this lady on John chapter 8. Huh. Just picture this, picture this for a second. If you have been in this situation where maybe it was an accident or something, or, or, or people corner you, you can have a little picture of what happened in the scriptures here. This woman was condemned to death. People were ready. I imagine, you know, this, this kid grabbing the best shape, you know, rock and look at it and kind of like cleaning it. And he was like, okay, let's go, let's go. She deserves that. She's a sinner. She commit this. And then Jesus, Jesus was just writing, he was just writing on the, on, the, on the dirt, not paying attention, not being distracted. There was a sin. She kind of deserved it. The guy too, okay? I don't know where was the guy, but that's another story. And then everyone were accusing, everyone. So when they continue asking, he raised himself and say to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stopped down, he stopped down, and then brought on the ground. Then those who heard this, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one. Picture this. I bet there was a, a lot of people ready, one by one, probably just this sound hitting the ground, the rocks. And one by one, people start leaving. Beginning with the oldest, even the last, and Jesus, was left alone, the only one righteous, and saw no one but the woman. And he said to her, woman, where are those accusers? Where are those accusers of you? Has no one condemned you? <laughs> and this really melts my heart. She said, no one, Lord. Probably this woman for a second thought, oh, it's you and me, now it's time, I'm done. But then Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, just go, sing no more. Oh, isn't this incredible? We deserve that. We, were, we deserve to be on the last second, you know, the executioner is there. 
And we're ready. I mean, it's like, okay, this is my last bread. And then Jesus said, no, no, no. It's mine. I pay for his sin. So church, as we are having this, this beautiful service, I just want to invite you to reflect on Jesus, on the cross, on his sacrifice. Yes, maybe you are dealing with depression. Maybe you are dealing with struggles. Maybe you're coming this morning like, well, I'll go to church one more time, but I can't change. I tried. I keep doing this. I keep doing that. And I can't change. Every day of our life, church, we come to Jesus. And I want to I wanna close with this. And I, I'm grateful for Samwa because he, he sent me this verse and it really touched my heart. Psalm 32, 5. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave my iniquity of my sin. This is the Lord, church. This is the Lord on this morning. I don't know what's your struggle. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know if you see family is struggling with and you said, I have no more words. Let me tell you, Jesus is the only solution for the sin. And I want to invite you to something. And I, and I really hope that you receive this for a moment. Can you close your eyes? Just there in your place, close your eyes for a second. And if, if you are feeling convicted, you know, by maybe sins that you have done in the past, or maybe you are thinking even on family that you're struggling with or feelings, can we say it, Lord, our surrender everything to you? I surrender everything to you. Lord, I cannot deal with sin, but you, you did it. And you won in the cross, Father. You won. And now we can be free. Huh. Now we can be free. Take a moment to pray and say, Lord, here's my life. Maybe you're tired of trying. Just say, Lord, I give all to you. And in that position, I want to invite you to something. This song is a Spanish song, but the, you're going to hear the words in English. And with that position that you have right now, can you just run to your father? As we were hearing from the Bible verses in the worship, just run to your father. Maybe in the condition that you are this morning, just run to your father, run to your father. Maybe right now you're realizing, I've been far all this time, just run to your father. Maybe you have been accused of something, just run to your father.